I already mentioned the bus workers struggle, that was in 2004, um, but in 2005, Reuters reported that thousands of banner-wielding Iranian workers rallied in Tehran, marking Labor Day with sharp criticism of the Islamic Republic's ambitious privatization plans. Their chants were stop privatization, stop temporary contracts. Um, it is now estimated uh, uh, that uh, some uh, tens of thousands of workers participated in that rally. Um, and this is, I think, really sort of the important, important fact of the matter, which is that uh, left to their own devices, the factions at the top are interested in pursuing one or another version of um, privatization and neoliberalism. The question is which faction really begins to dominate. The only class that has an interest in um, pursuing radical social change to its end, um, getting, better, uh, uh, getting a better kind of economy, um, actually get winning full democratic rights, actually winning full social reforms, is inside of the working class who do not have interest in maintaining either a privatization scheme, nor do they have any sort of vested interest in the Bilal de Faki. They may hold Islamic uh, values, they may be Muslims at heart, but their interests are clearly not getting represented by the regime that's in power. And it's going to be, I think, when um, uh, this class of people begins to put up forward its own uh, parties, its own leaders, its own figures, uh, that you're going to begin to see more radical change take place in Iran. Uh, I guess we can have uh, 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A if anyone has any questions before we go to the next question. Uh, the, the role of the Mujahideen of Power has like the... Uh, I mean, Currently or something? No, in the, in the past, like in the revolution. And, uh, How do you see the role of the Mujahideen I, 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 I mean, uh, you, you refer to the laborers, I don't know if you consider them as laborers? Or well, they had, they had a kind of interesting policy, right? The Mujahideen tried to organize inside the workplaces for a good decade, and then abandoned that project for the countryside organizing, which they did in the late 70s. Um, they actually had, a, they shift their theory about how they're going to attempt to make a revolution inside of Iran. At one point it is, you know, um, we will organize inside of the working class, and then it becomes we will organize with the peasantry. Um, and I don't, I, I, see this is the thing, I think that all of these forces that fought in the revolution were doing really heroic things in 79. I mean, unbelievable what it must have meant to be Mujahideen or Fadayin or Tudeh in uh, 78, well Tudeh, I don't know if they formally exist in 79, but amazingly heroic things. They're imprisoned, they're attacked by the Shah um, uh, in ruthless ways, much of their leadership is killed. And in that respect, one can't they did abandon the project of working class organizing in favor of a different strategy. Um, one that attempted to, you know, um, short circuit, I think, um, organizing in the, in the major cities, and that gave way for Khomeini and his forces to take over completely. I mean, they had, they, there, was no, there was no competition for Khomeini's ideas in the urban centers, and that's more or less what leaves the field open. It's, it's heroic to wage a guerrilla struggle in the countryside, but it didn't actually, at the end of the day, put up enough of a political competition, you know. Um, the left is very heroic. They make some, also some terrible mistakes, and, uh, in, in the waging of the revolution. Um, I don't know what else can be said. I mean, that's the history of the revolution, is the slaughter of the secular left, uh, you know, by uh, first the Shah and then the Islamists when they come to power. So I always, I mean, I had always this uh, question that who, would, who were the people who actually supported Khomeini and who, who were the people who were recruited or fooled or whatever you may um, have, have you read uh, Irvin Abrahamian's book on the yes. Iranian Revolution, right? Yes. I think his thesis is basically right. Um, though he argues that um, more or less Khomeini is very cagey, right? He's never clear about what his political right. program will be. And the basic basic things that he says on the tapes, and this is the only way that people know him, right? The, the cassette tapes that get circulated in the 70s, because he's an exile in Paris, right? In the, yes. Most of the 70s. So um, what he basically says is, look, I want to end the dictatorship. Nobody has a problem with that. I want to alleviate your suffering. Nobody has a problem with that. I am for you know some variety of social uplift for all of you. I think um, Islam holds some qualities of justice, and we need the United States out of our country. Nobody disagrees with any of that, right? I mean, and basically, um, when he's not asked to produce a kind of political program of what he wants to, he never says "Bilai the Faki before '79. I mean, that's not none of the tapes, right? Uh, but be, when he comes to power. Um, he quickly discovers that his power is going to rest on something very, very different than what the Shah's power rested on, and it cannot be what the popular protests are doing in the streets of, in Iran. Um, they want a far different kind of you know, social pattern of organizing life in Iran. So he sets up the comités, he sets up the, uh, you know, the pasaran, the morality police, 
Um, and those things began, and, and then a whole process of consolidating uh, middle class that's allied to his Islamic values happens over the next three years. You have a million people entering into the bureaucracy between 79 and 82, all whose jobs depend on their allegiance to Khomeini. Um, and slowly they're able to liquidate the, their opposition, right? Anybody who is opposed to what Khomeini does is called an agent of US imperialism. So there goes the Mujahideen cult, right? They're opposing what Khomeini is doing off with their heads. No, I mean, and that more or less became the strategy between 79 and 82 when the left is just destroyed. But then they, they also fell for Khomeini's, you know, the caginess or whatever. Yeah, they, they, they definitely, well, okay, so we can talk about this if you want to talk about the Iranian revolution. If, uh, but no, I think, I think so, and part of the reason was that they had um, this theory that Iran was an underdeveloped country, it needed to go through some level of capitalist development, and that there was a divide between what they called the progressive elements of Iranian capitalism and the reactionary elements of Iranian capitalism. Shah's friends were reactionary, Khomeini's friends were progressive. So you could back Khomeini, but you couldn't back the Shah. And backing Khomeini ended up meaning getting themselves killed. Uh, that's what it meant at the end of the day uh, when the Iranian revolution was completed. So I, I actually, I, I highly recommend the Avery Hamian history of the Iranian revolution. It's very, very good. He, he also has another book called The Mujahideen of Iran that's also very, very informative. Um, but on the same token, um, so what do you see current situation, or actually what do you see the future of Iran? Because you mentioned that the, pretty much uh, the labor movement is very, very uh, you know, integral part of the, what is going on in, you know, right now in the green movement. Do you really believe that, you know, that like in let's say three to five years from now, that would be actually a, a big, huge impact on the... Uh, Absolutely. I mean, um, the thing that you're finding now is that um, strikes that three years ago wouldn't have been able to win, Ahmadinejad has to give concessions to because he cannot fight them and fight protesters in the street at the same time. So it's a grass movement and labor movement that is going Yeah, I mean, and, and the thing too is that I think that people have underestimated how creative um, ordinary people have been in organizing under really <coughs> repressive situations. Um, underground unions, which you saw openly for the first time uh, in June when these protests were coming out in the streets, you would see people marching as labor contingents together in some of the protests. Um, I actually think this is a very exciting. The women's movement, my goodness, right? right? Really heroic. It's, I mean, who is the who is the hero of the of the green movement? It's mm -hmm. it's it's Nida, right? I mean, it's the woman who is killed by. Um, uh, How do you see these two? Um, they clearly have some friction. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they all they like each other very much, but uh, Tom and he does not have anybody else to rely on at this point. I mean, after the June elections where he said Ahmadinejad wins, anybody who protests Ahmadinejad is more or less you know, a traitor to the country, he doesn't have any options. And it seems to me that what you're beginning to see is some of the fissures between what Khamenei wants and what Ahmadinejad wants. I don't know if it'll go to a crisis where there'll be a rupture between the two. I think they both know that they require one another, but um, it's very clear that uh, Ahmadinejad has more, um, the leash is not as short as Khamenei thinks that it is for Ahmadinejad. Right? He's able to do some things, put some people into his government that Khamenei doesn't want. Uh, there are obviously accusations about um, Ahmadinejad circulating around like that he you know paid off people in villages and things of that nature. Right. Uh, you know, in order to get votes. So maybe not only were the results swayed, but he also kind of bought off some voters too in the process. Uh, do you see that be, being a very big obstacle to overcome? Because I mean I think at some point the working class and these people, these very low income people kind of will overlap. Well, uh, the, much is made of sort of the rural poor in Iran, but they're a very small section of the population, right? Uh, majority of people in Iran live in cities, or towns bigger than 5,000 people, right? 5,000 and above sort of urban settings, right? So the rural poor, it, it's important, and he may very well have been able to give some amount of money, although I can't imagine that it's a massive sum, and I can't imagine that it's a sustainable amount of money, but if I was desperately poor in the countryside and some guy gave me money to survive, I would Right? I mean, that's not terribly surprising that they uh, would do something like that. And I don't put it past Ahmadinejad. He, that's been his schemes as long as he's been in power, the sort of handouts. He